So uh, guys, Dan, uh, Dan's intro reads like a reads like a novel. I mean, you literally need an editor to just decide like which parts to share and uh, and which parts uh, not to share. But um, Dan Jan, uh, he started with uh, with the uh, the book company in the uh, the early '90s. Did five summers with a top ten rookie, um, won all the awards there. Uh, professionally, in 1996, he worked for Web TV. Um, started uh, or helped uh, grow a, a business that became a uh, uh, was bought by Microsoft for half a billion dollars, um, VP of sales uh, for a company called Intermedia, uh, which was sold for 127 million in 1999. Um, he's competed in the Olympics uh, as a as a bobsledder uh, for the for the Armenian uh, Olympic team in 2002. Um, he's a uh, Hollywood actor. Uh, he's appeared in movies uh, such as Sea Biscuit, The Longest Yard. Has been in two reality shows. Um, was an actor, probably best known uh, his acting career for. Um, uh, appearing in the cult hit The Room, and uh, was played by Zac Efron. If any of you guys watched The Disaster Artist, uh, the movie about uh, The Room, um, Dan was played by Zac Efron, which I, they could have done better. I mean, not not the uh, I, they they kind of downgraded Dan, um, but you know, hey, still uh, still still pretty impressive. So started with uh, with us in 2004. In um, 2015, he also co-authored a book with Jack Canfield. Um, who's best known as the author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, but uh, in 2004, started with FHL, multiple Centurion winner. In 2013, he broke the company record for the most sales in a week. Uh, he wrote 94 applications for over 68,000 um, in, uh, in premium. That's in one week. Um, and uh, was the number one team leader in 2014 with 2.6 million annual sales and become, became an agency owner in, uh, in 2015. In addition to that, but wait, there's more. He's also a, a private pilot, uh, has his black belt in uh, karate, um, and uh, most recently was a congressional candidate. Uh, he is a proud father of Jenica, Landon, and, uh, and Nevi. Guys, uh, join me in welcoming. Stay on mute. Just We can hear it. We can feel it. Um, Mr. Dan Jandigan, who's going to talk to us about the power of combining talent and hard work. Dan, take Morning. it away. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Awesome. Awesome. Nate. Thanks for having me on this morning. Uh, I got to tell you, this is probably the most, I don't know if nervous is the right word, but uh, uh, I, was, I, I was up until 3.30 this morning uh, trying to make sure that I was especially prepared for this. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you throughout my, uh, my talk today why that was uh, so important to me. But suffice it to say, uh, the group of leaders that you guys are surrounded with are amazing. Um, I've known Travis and Nate for years, uh, two of the most unbelievable people I've met. Uh, I always joke around that Nate's been given way too many uh, blessings. Uh, you shouldn't be that good looking, be able to speak that well and be that talented in the field all at the same time. That, that should be spread out a little bit more evenly. So uh, just hold him to a high, high, uh, high standard. It's great to have Amanda on this call. Uh, Arndt, great to see you in Cleveland. Uh, Tuma, all you guys, uh, this is just really exciting for me. But it's interesting. You guys are going to see that there's a little bit of a theme going on here tonight uh, or this morning. And, uh, and my kind of story for you guys will start in the 90s uh, because I was kind of a child of the 80s and 90s. And the 90s were an interesting decade, right? That was the, the year I was uh, graduating high school, graduated college in 96, you know, did my Southwestern uh, career, started that, which has led very directly here. Uh, that was the decade that the Cold War ended. Right, that was the World Wide Web's debut. That was when cell phones started to take place for those of you guys that are a little bit younger. Um, that was the decade of Clinton, right? The Monica Lewinsky stand scandal. That's when the Branch Davidians out here, about an hour and a half from me, uh, uh, took over Waco. Uh, Oklahoma City bombings happened in that decade. The O.J. Simpson trial, the L.A. riots. Um, but that was also the year that a young college graduate created a dynasty and, uh, and started that process. Now, I know you guys are on mute, but how many of you guys know who Sam Bowie is? How many of you guys know that name? Right? Sam Bowie, if you don't know the name, was the number two pick in the 1984 NBA draft. Hakeem Olajuwon was number one, and uh, Sam Bowie was number two. And the reason this is so important to this call this morning is because the Portland Trailblazers went with Sam Bowie as the number two pick, and I'm sure Sam's a great guy, but the number three pick, the guy who dropped all the way to number three was a, a guy by the name of Michael Jordan, picked up by the Chicago Bulls. 
tell me that the Timberwolves are, uh, excuse me, the uh, Portland Trailblazers are not still uh, uh, hurting from that one. So we all know the story, right? Michael Jordan came to the Bulls and took a franchise that was absolutely horrendous and turned it into a dynasty. Six titles in seven years. He was the rookie of the year, being the first person to ever lead the league as a rookie in four different categories. Six times uh, finals MVP. He was a 14-time All-Star. Nine-time All-Defensive First Team. Ten-time uh, scoring champion. Two-time slam dunk champion. Uh, he was also a gold medalist. And he actually got that gold medal, his first one, before he even entered the league uh, on the year that he was drafted. But he was also cut from his high school basketball team. And that's where this story begins. Think about this. When you think about people that you consider to be great, almost all of them have had a fall from grace at some point. They've all had to start from somewhere. And as a 16-year-old being cut from his high school basketball team, where do you think that Michael Jordan was at that time? You know, what was, what was his vision at that time? How did he see himself? What did he picture his life would look like um, when he went through that? You know, did he see all those accomplishments? Is that something that he could see still happening? Um, or did he accept the fact that he just wasn't good enough? Everyone and everything in his environment at that time was reinforcing the fact that he wasn't good enough to play at the varsity level in a high school sport. And we know what he led into. So what is vision? I think that's where we're gonna, where we're gonna kind of uh, springboard off of this morning is the idea of vision and why vision is so important in your companies and, and so important in your lives. And I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing people. Larry Salerno uh, has a great definition of vision, which uh, I've tried to pare down over the years. And I think um, the best definition I've been able to find is that in life, vision is truly seeing what doesn't yet exist. It's being able to see that thing that's not there yet. So let me share a story about, about vision and, uh, and being able to see what doesn't exist. In February of 2018, I had the opportunity to, uh, and as I'm sure you guys can guess, I'm a huge fan of the Olympics, especially the Winter Olympics. And the Super G is one of the most amazing things to watch. And Lindsey Vaughn was in her final competition, Olympic competition. She's one of the most decorated skiers of all time. And everybody had eyes on Lindsey in the Super G competition. And this is a, a, a crazy race because if you ever watch Super G, it takes all the, the highest uh, skilled portions of skiing and puts it all into one race. You're just absolutely jettisoning down a probably a one mile, two mile long track. You're, if you leave the ground, you leave the ground for, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 yards minimum uh, as you're jumping. You're taking these absolutely crazy turns and you're going at speeds that would eclipse most race cars. And, you know, if you crash in a Super G, uh, it's, it's not a pretty sight. But this story is not about Lindsey Vaughn. Um, while I'm watching this, it was, it was amazing. NBC was showing this, this, uh, uh, this event, and they always show the top you know, 15 to 20 skiers in an event. And the reason is because the rest of the skiers are not really, uh, you know, they're, they're not really gonna be qualified to, to be able to win. They don't wanna waste time or waste your time or whatever watching it. And so as you watched, Lindsey Vaughn was the first one to go, had a decent run, but uh, pretty obviously was not gonna be able to take that medal. And uh, as the race went on, uh, there was a great story about a woman by the name of Anna uh, Veith, who was from Austria. And her story was amazing because she's a top skier, but she had broken her foot the year before, and they didn't even know if she'd be able to compete. Um, but this story is also not about Anna Veith. The story is about when they uh, told, or when, when Anna had gone and she had an unbelievable run and uh, was given the, uh, the accolades by NBC as being the gold medalist, and they left and they started watching uh, another event, another Olympic event, they moved on from that. And about five minutes in that event, they put a big special bulletin on the screen and said, hey, we need to go back because something absolutely amazing happened. And they went back and they showed a recording of this little Czech girl flying down the track. Now, to give you a little bit of background on her, she's a snowboarder. She's a phenomenal snowboarder, not known as a skier at all. She borrowed a set of skis from Michaela Schifrin, who didn't end up skiing in that race. So she borrowed skis. And... They're, wa they're showing you coming down the track. And you can watch this. It's amazing to watch on YouTube because if, if you watch the, the actual feed from the NBC Olympics, uh, they are showing her coming down the track. And there's no commentary. Nobody was watching her. Nobody was doing anything. But as she came down to the bottom third of the track, you knew that she was putting herself in a position to win this race. And she ended up winning by 0.011, one one-hundredth of a second. She took the gold. And uh, her name's Esther Ledeca. And she took the gold. 
and absolutely shocked the world. And they asked her, they said afterwards, what did you do? How did you do this? Because if you look at her at the end of the race, she's not jumping for joy. She's looking at the, at the scoreboard with her mouth wide open. Can't believe that she's actually won this race, much less medaled. And, uh, and she said, you know, when I went down, I had a vision in my mind of the exact run I needed to do to get down the track the fastest. She pictured it. She ran it. She saw what was, what was possible, and she accomplished it. So the question for today is how do we turn that vision? Every one of us should have a vision, right? How do we turn that vision into reality? And I think there's three keys, in my opinion, to taking a vision, taking something that you want to accomplish and making that your reality. And the first of those three keys is passion. You need to know what your passion is. Let me just tell you, I don't wake up in the morning excited about insurance. <laughs> it's not the thing that gets me fired up. It doesn't get a fire lit under me. Um, you know, but you've got to find out what about the industry gets you excited, no matter what industry you're in, you know, is it the money? Is it the ability to be able to support your family at a high level? Is it ownership in a company? Is it the challenge, right? Taking on something new that maybe you haven't done before that you haven't done at a certain level before. Maybe it's, uh, just being able to have an empty schedule, right? Being able to be able to do what you want when you want and not be part of a job. Uh, maybe it's to protect families. You've had family members that have gone through something like cancer and, and you have a passion of protecting other people. You know, we have so many people that, especially with what we're going through in the world right now, that are passionate in what they do and, and we love them for it, right? Healthcare workers right now, our, our first responders are so passionate. They're going to work. A lot of people are working in areas where they don't have masks, they don't have gloves, and they're still having to go to work and they're having to perform to save other people because they're passionate about saving other people. You know, think about the people that you see in your life on a day-to-day -day basis that are passionate about things that you think are absolutely crazy, right? Maybe it's a server in a restaurant and they just love their job. You know, maybe it's the garbage guy that you see every Tuesday morning that's just smiling and whistling. You know, we, we see YouTube videos of these guys, you know, doing the moonwalk and picking up their, you know, picking up garbage and loving their job. They're passionate about what they do. Uh, maybe it's digging holes, whatever it is, you've got to find a passion. Uh, about that thing and you've got to love it and you've got to find a way to love it. You don't have to love your job. You don't have to love selling insurance. You don't have to love selling knives or, or, or doing what you want, but you've got to find something about that that you're passionate about. You know, for me, for example, one of the things I'm most passionate about is my people. I love working with Chad Buehlers and the Gene Hickmans and the Lane Pierces and the Peter Holgeens and the Ron Millers of the world. Um, and that's what gets me up. That's what drives me on a daily basis. The second key is discipline. I've always said that the probably two greatest um, industries that feed into our industry are military and athletes. And if you look around, there's a lot of people that fall in those two categories uh, within our businesses. And the great thing about discipline and, and when it comes to those is that, you know, if you're in the military or, you know, if you're an athlete, for example, you have to have discipline. You know, it takes tens of thousands of hours to be able to do what some of these top people do. Greg Luganis used to talk about the amount of, um, you know, the thousands of hours that he would put in to make one dive, right? He was one of the, you know, most renowned divers in the world. But that dive would only take, you know, fractions of a couple of seconds. You know, from the beginning to the end, that's all it took before you'd hit the water. But he put in tens of thousands of hours just to get ready for that couple of seconds of a dive. You know, if you're in the military, they teach you discipline, right? They make you be disciplined. You know, if you're not disciplined, they're going to they're gonna work you until you are. And when it comes to discipline, I love the story of Walter Payton. Walter Payton was, uh, and, and still is, uh, one of the greatest running backs that's ever played in football history. Yeah, he played with the Chicago Bulls during their, uh, excuse me, for the uh, uh, Chicago Bears during their heyday back in the mid-80s, um, was part of the 1985 shuffling crew and was, uh, uh, was part of their Super Bowl championship team. But Walter Payton was a five foot 10, 200 pound running back who for all intents, if you just looked at his, you know, his stats on paper was not that big, <clears throat> you know, was not necessarily that fast, but he had discipline and did the things necessary to create himself as being the greatest of his time, if not all time. Uh, I, I think my favorite story about Walter was the way that he would train. Whenever he would go out and train, he would have a medical worker with him a doctor that he had on site for every one of his trainings. And he was famous for harnessing a, 
uh, a car tire, a large car tire to the back of uh, himself. He'd have, he'd have ropes around his shoulders and he would uh, run as fast as he could uphill dragging this tire. And he would do that over and over again until he ultimately passed out and had to be uh, brought back. And then he would get up and do it again. And that kind of discipline, that was his idea of what he needed to do in order to not just be good, but to be great. And for him to accomplish the things that he did. Um, you know, a few stats about Walter Payton. He, he ran for over uh, 16,700 yards in his career with the Bears. He had over 4,500 additional yards in receiving with the Bears. And if you break all that down, he averaged 4.4 yards per carry with the Bears. And if you're a football fan of any kind, you understand that when it's first down, you've got four tries to make it 10 yards. And if you've got a guy in your team that averages four and a half yards per carry, he's getting you what you need in, in basically your first two plays. And that's a, that, is, that is somebody who's taking a team to a new level with his individual commitment because of his discipline and wanting to be great. The third key is relentless. You've got to be relentless. This page takes me back to Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan is probably best known for rising to the occasion. He still does it now. He, he runs a lot of camps. And if you challenge Jordan, he, he flips it. It's just a different level uh, that he brings it to. And you can see story after story after story of Michael Jordan. When somebody calls him out, um, you know, it, it, it's something that you are just not supposed to do, uh, especially if you're going to play him in a big game. But back in June of 1997, uh, Michael played in what was uh, very, very well, a very well-known game known as the flu game. And this was game five of the NBA finals. And uh, this series was played against Utah Jazz. And it's a, it's a great series. Uh, the first two games were won by the Bulls. Uh, and the second two games, the Jazz came back and really annihilated the Bulls on that fourth game. And, and it was, it was well known around the league that Michael had been battling this flu uh, throughout the series and going into game five, it had gotten so bad, especially because he hadn't recovered, hadn't given him the opportunity to recover, that most of his teammates knew that he was not going to be playing in that game. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, and again, in a seven-game series, game five is so pivotal, pivotal in a tied series. It just, it's, it's one of the most important games you can win because you're only a game away at that point uh, of putting away the other team. So with the series tied at two to two, uh, of course, who showed up on the court? Michael Jordan. And Watching videos of him showing up, I mean, he was sweating. You know, before the game started, before he started warming up, he was out there and you could see beads of sweat coming down the back of his neck. Um, for a guy who never slouched over, who was always up and always just showed you he was ready to attack and kill, he had his hands on his knees. He was not in a good place. And um, I I'm not going to surprise you when I tell you that the, uh, the story ends with Michael Jordan taking the, uh, the team to a two-point victory to win game five. And as I'm talking to you guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and, and really show you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to show you a, a couple of pictures here. This is Michael Jordan being uh, helped off the court by Scottie Pippen at the end of the game. This is Michael Jordan during the game. And this is Michael Jordan that went out and hit 38 points, seven rebounds, five assists, and had three steals playing in a game that he was absolutely not supposed to play in because he was relentless in his pursuit of victory. He was relentless in making sure that his team accomplished what it needed to accomplish. Understand that being relentless does not equal not failing. Okay. Being relentless does not mean that you won't fail. Okay. Failure is a necessity in what we do. And it's the only way to get good. But the question is, are you relentless enough to continue to drive through that failure to get to what you need to, to be the champion that you truly can be? You know, in 2010, I declared bankruptcy. Um, I had a restaurant that failed. Uh, I've had the opportunity to have several restaurants. This one came, took me down with it, right? I was worse off financially than I had ever been. I just got married uh, to my wife, who was a single mom. So, you know, I went from supporting one person to four people. Uh, and that was a, that was a, a huge, huge failure for me to go through, but a big one to learn from. In 2018, I had my worst production year as an agency owner, right? Um, absolutely fell on my face. Uh, my, my, my numbers were the worst that they have ever been, um, possibly in any sales situation I've been in. 
in 2020, I got crushed this year, right? Running for Congress. And the thing that was the hardest about that is I had worked my butt off, right? I had done what I thought was necessary to put myself in a position to win. Every part of you, when you go through a failure, wants to curl up into a corner, but no matter how hard you get knocked down, you need to understand that you need to keep getting up and up and up and up. So why do I love Michael Jordan? Well, in 1996, I remember thinking, wow, you know, someday I'm going to have kids and I'll be able to tell them that I saw Michael Jordan, right? I was able to be around that greatness. I was able to experience that greatness. And, you know, it's so interesting because when you talk about Michael and you talk about what he was able to accomplish, you know, Michael is the first one to talk about failure and he'll share his failures. And one of the things that he says, and I love this quote, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot, and I've missed. I've failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. You guys, you have to understand that there is no success in what you do that, that is not predicated on you at some point failing uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that thing, whatever it is. All of us fail. It's just whether, you're not, whether or not you're going to pick yourself up and go from there. Um, you know, it's interesting. For some of us, you know, there's so many folks that I, I see that have the talent, uh, that, that absolutely have the talent. Um, and, and it's just crazy because there's nothing that's more common in this world than unrealized talent, right? So many of us have talents and skills in different areas, um, but it's unrealized. And greatness to me is the pairing of talent and discipline. This is why I've talked to you about, you know, you know Walter Payton today. This is why I've talked about Michael Jordan. This is why I love um, people that work at this level because we all have a certain talent, but very, very seldom do we find people that take that talent and put it with the discipline and the work effort that allows them to accomplish greatness. There is a ton of guys out there that have talent beyond belief in the NBA, right? But we've only had one Michael Jordan in our lifetime. And you can love LeBron. I love LeBron. You can love Kobe, but they're not Michael, you know? But they do completely work at their, at their highest levels because we see them put in the effort that goes along and goes uh, in the – it goes along with their talent. So I want to wrap up with one last quote. And uh, I, I love this because it's, uh, it's something I think about on a regular basis. This is my definition of hell. And I, uh, I, I can't say that I, I came up with this. This is an anonymous quote, but I heard it decades ago. And uh, I think it's important to think about. The quote goes like this. On your last day on earth, the person you become or excuse me, on your last day on earth, the person you became will meet the person you could have become. You guys, find your vision, be passionate, disciplined, and relentless in achieving it, and uh, learn from your leaders. You guys are surrounded by the very best. Kelly Connedy asks, about your best week, how much of that did you envision before that week started? Did you envision those families getting protected and the activities needed to get you there? That's a fantastic question because uh, I can be honest and say, no, I absolutely didn't envision that before the week started. Um, you know, that year I was working uh, just train wars. I, I was, I was uh, in my, uh, that was the year that we actually uh, had the top team uh, in the country. And I had gone out because uh, we were starting to fall off the of track. Uh, that was presidential performance week. It was in the first quarter. And I, I, I was very conscious of the fact that our team wasn't, getting where they needed to get to, you know, they just weren't, they weren't, we were doing well, but we just, you, you can, you can, you can smell it in the air when you can feel that kind of decrepitness kicking in and people are about to get off. And so um, I, I went out and challenged Ron Miller <laughs> and Nate actually did a great interview about this years ago, but um, you know, I went out and, and challenged Ron Miller to, to go out and, and, you know, who could have the best work, uh, work uh, numbers for that first day in the field. And I had nothing set up. We were down at a train more, about four hours away from my home and, uh, you know, went out that first day and, you know, put in the work habits, but, um, had a really good day. I think I ended up with seven or 8,000 in premium, uh, which was a great way to start off a, a train more. And then, uh, going into the second day, um, you know, Ron started upping the ante. And so we started, you know, he wasn't at the train more. We were talking on the phone, but I had an accountability partner. I had somebody who was driving me all week, uh, and, you know, uh, somebody who had, who's an amazing, amazing salesperson still is, still is the number one person uh, in the company. Um, and, and just wanted to, 
uh, I wanted to show him that I was still relevant. And so that's where I started to kind of create my vision for the week. I thought, wow, if I can do it one day, maybe I can do it for five or six or seven or eight. And by the time the week rolled around, you know, I was sitting, I was only at about 40 or 45,000 uh, by the end of the week uh, on Friday. And, um, and I had over 5,000 in cancellations uh, that had already happened at that point. And I remember thinking, there's just no way. I mean, I've got three more days if I want to try and beat Jack Clark's record. But Ron was still, you know, he was, you know, he's known for sandbagging. He doesn't, he doesn't really give his stats during train wars. You hear about it after it's all done. And I just knew he was there with me and I wanted to beat Ron. And so my vision uh, was about every day going out and hitting the Eagle. And, um, you know, everybody went home from the train war. Um, I stayed out there by myself uh, on Saturday and, and, and worked and Sunday and worked and Monday and worked and came home on Tuesday and ended up uh, beating Ron by uh, less than a handful of apps. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was really, it was a vision that was happening as we were going, but it was a short-term vision. Uh, it was never planned for, uh, but when we were in the middle of it, the plan began, and, and the plan is what, what got us to the finish line. 